So, um, you know, with blockchain, so many people have, have now kind of seen and analogize this to the internet, um, that, that, that the kinds of issues and the kinds of movements that are emerging now are just like, you know, what we went through in, in the 90s. Well, today um, we have a, a very special guest um, who, who forged that trail uh, back in the 90s. And I'm, we're, we're very excited to welcome here to, um, to address us um, as we build this new infrastructure and see what lessons we could carry from that experience. So without further ado, let me introduce John Perry Barlow. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking that I really literally needed no introduction. I guess it, <laughs> I was going to wait until you said my name, and then I would come. Uh, but uh, yes, I am John Perry Barlow. Uh, did any of you read the Washington Post on Friday? Nobody. Oh, you're way, way back there. Well, then I won't make much of an example of it. But um, there is a species of article that I've become extremely familiar with over the last 20 years, where somebody who has just published a book, some grumpy person, usually usually uh, the victim of a, of a savage postmodernist education. <laughs> uh, just barely learning how to speak English again. And uh, uh, feels vaguely that there is something just kind of rotten about technology, and, and who doesn't feel that, uh, since technology has a way of, of taking away everything that's familiar and replacing it with something that isn't. Uh, and indeed, one characteristic of technology is that that every time we create a, a new technology-based solution, we create at least two, maybe three new problems, and hence, combined with the desire of the men to, imp to impress the women, uh, is the march of civilization in a nutshell. Uh, that's all there is to it, really. Uh, and. Lately, uh, technology has been creating new problems at such a prodigious rate that uh, their solutions are even more proliferative. And you can see the sort of heading for the ceiling kind of logarithmic curve that all of this is on, which is part of why people feel uh, a sense of estrangement in their own time. And it's very interesting to try to get pe pin people down on what they think technology is. I mean, I, I got into an argument with a TSA le agent last year when I started to explain to her that my shoes were technology and that language was technology, and I realized that this was not going to help <laughs> a bit. So um, what people often have, and this, is, and this is an American trait, I think, dominantly because of Puritanism. It's also, to some extent, a French trait because of Descartes. Uh, to some degree, it's a German trait because of Hegel, and, and half the world got indoctrinated in it because of Marx. But there's a way of seeing the world where everything is either or. It is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I mean, I don't know how, if you just sit, I mean, I can't imagine exposing yourself to, a, to an entire evening of network, network news or, or, or cable news, but I assure you that uh, uh, over the course of any evening watching CNN, you'll hear, hear somebody say at least four or five times, is this a good thing or a bad thing? As if they were neatly divided uh, with a very bright line. Well, when I first discovered the internet, and believe me, it was, uh, I can't tell you how excited I was, because uh, I had, in college, I had read a fellow named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was a French theologian and paleontologist and evolutionary theorist. Uh, who had, who shared a feeling that I had, which was that it, 
it seemed rather obvious that that despite entropy, which, which ought to be heading everything toward disorder and heat death as quickly as possible, uh, there was this other vector, this teleological arc that was headed at least sort of up, sometimes quite a ways up, where systems were becoming more complex. And, and uh, that which was simple was, was being made into that which was not simple at all uh, over the course of the evolutionary process. And Chardin, being a, uh, a Jesuit monk, believed that at a certain near-term point, the whole evolutionary process would leave the flesh, the flesh would become word, so to speak, and uh, you would have evolution proceeding along a path that Richard Dawkins, unfortunately, later jumped on. It would have been better if it had been somebody who was a little, a little less either orish in his view of things. But uh, nevertheless, he came up with the, me the word meme much later. But I, in reading Chardin, I felt like there was something extremely persuasive about the idea that there was a collective organism of mind that was already evident on the planet. I could feel it. Uh, and I could, see, I could see literal evidence of it. And there had been evidence of it all along. I mean, for example, Leibniz and, and Newton, as most of you know, uh, intuited the calculus in about the same fortnight. Uh, they had and they, their notation was different enough so that it seems pretty obvious that it was a completely independent uh, conclusion that they had reached. Uh, and unfortunately, Newton spent the rest of his life trying to prove that Leibniz had ripped him off, one of the first people ruined by, by uh, intellectual property uh, of many to come. And, uh, and uh, Leibniz uh, went blithe on about his business and, and, among other things, invented the bit. And uh, was so delighted. I mean, he invented the bit by, by realizing that the only reason that we had base 10 numbering systems was because we had these. And there could be base 37 numbering systems. There could, in fact, be base 1 and 0 numbering systems, which for him was, aha, it's either or. And so he, he wrote a long letter to the emperor of China. I mean, I just, I think it's wonderful that people would do things like that. <laughs> Who was, and he really thought it would get delivered, and it did. Uh, uh, saying that, you know, we disproved your, your sense that everything is one thing thus. There is the sacred, the fame, there is the, there is the divine, there is the, the earthly, there is the there's the flesh, there's the word, there's the everything and the everything else. And uh, it took a cycle of, I think, eight or nine years for the emperor of China to get back to him, with, which is still marvelous, with uh, a copy of the Tao Te Ching translated into Latin, uh, which basically said, I see your point, but we look at it this way. And I... I wish more people looked at it the way the Emperor of China did. Uh, because here lately, uh, there has been, well, and by lately, I mean over the course of, of my life, uh, which in human affairs is pretty lately, there has been a continuous struggle between the forces of imposed order and the forces of a rising order uh, between what I would characterize as obligation and what I would characterize as responsibility, between, um, on, the, on the furthest reaches, between fascism and anarchy, uh, between, um, you know, whether you, whether you mount your fish on the wall or whether you eat them, actually. I mean, it comes down to things like that. But, uh, there is a war that's been going on since sometime around the time of the Kennedy assassination 
between the 50s and the 60s. And actually, it's a much bigger war than that. It's, it's a war between the three monotheistic religions and the fact that they can no longer get a large number of people to believe that all useful knowledge is contained within the covers of a single book. Now, the fact that they can get a lot of people to believe that it is, is remarkable to me. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I think that they are in serious trouble is, is the number of people who are willing to, as of this morning, you know, beat a woman to death because she might have done some bad thing to, that, to one of those books while the police stood by because she had it coming. Turned out she hadn't done the bad thing to the book, but that didn't matter. It was, this, it was the principle of the thing. And, and, and of course, so that what we're seeing is exactly what Teilhard de Chardin wrote about, but was not permitted, being a Jesuit monk, to publish until after his death. He wrote about it in the 30s and then, and then published posthumously. And that was that all of the religions were going to have to come to grips with the fact that there was contained within nature a proof of some kind of divine order as he, as he saw it. Uh, and in fact, he, he thought that what was, what was going on was, was the, the, the evolution of a mind that was capable of keeping God company, which I thought was a charming notion. Uh, and I think God gets plenty of company anyway. But uh, for some reason, when I read him, and I think it probably had something to do with the fact that I took acid about the same time, uh, the combination made me a lifelong devotee of, of trying to serve that vector which is basically headed up and is self-evolving and is not imposed and is not, and is not the, the result of some ideology or another, but simply is nature expressing itself in a positive fashion. Uh, there, I even had a literary agent in New York who created a word to apply to me, which was pronoid. She called, she called me a pronoid. Uh, I went ahead and spread that word around, and now it is in common parlance. I, I, there's a book called Pronoia. Uh, and it is the, the belief that the universe is a conspiracy on your behalf. <laughs> and I think there's evidence that it is. Uh, when you consider how remarkable is the assembly of any life form, I'm presently growing a lot of one-celled plants, mostly, and some animals, you know, gazillions of them in, on Mobile Bay. And I watch them in a microscope all the time. And I watch them trying to come up with multicellular arrangements and doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, but they keep trying to do that, and it just it seems like it's wired into them. They want to, they want to become uh, more orderly. And the, and the net, when I discovered it, seemed like the nervous system of this thing that I had thought about and, and felt a, a sense of, uh, if you'll forgive the term, di you know, divine inspiration about. Uh, and as soon as I found the internet, uh, I'd been in the cattle business for about 20 years and, and I was in competition against people. You know, I mean, one of my neighbors was James Baker. One of my neighbors was the guy that was the president of Pepsi-Cola. had another neighbor that owned all of the A&P stores in Europe. And I was what was wrong with that picture. <laughs> I had a large ranch in the middle of this and I wasn't doing it as a hobby. And, and um, uh, so these guys didn't shake out at the bottom of the market. And I finally decided that I would go and serve something else while I still had time to do it. And I, and I became, uh, in about 1985, I became an internet guru at a time when there weren't very many of us. Uh, and, and part of the reason that I wanted to do that was because I had been basically raised by a combination of farm animals and drunken cowboys. 
Uh, my parents were very, were, were, had been married for 20 some odd years when I was born. They were under the impression they couldn't have kids. They were on a ranch in the middle of nowhere. I had no siblings except for a twin brother who took one look at the physical world and headed back. And, um, and so I, there was nobody else around. And I was not raised exactly wild, but close to it. And I, um, I, I had always been very uneasy with any kind of authority. And th this is also true dominantly in the place where I come from. Uh, Wyoming is a place that doesn't like authority because they can't see a good reason for it. Now, in most urban areas, there's plenty good reason for it. Uh, but one of the things that we are grappling with and we will be grappling with at this conference, fundamentally, is that a relatively recent development in the history of, of governance or government is the nation state, uh, which arose in about, 60, about the same time that Leibniz sent his letter to the emperor of China. Uh, and has been under the impression that it was an absolute necessity uh, in order for anything useful to get done and worth you know, giving millions of lives for uh, because if not that, then what? And I always was very suspicious of the nation state Wyoming is 75% owned by a nation state and they do a very bad job of trying to manage their part of it. And um, so I did everything I could for quite a while to subvert the nation state. And then after I got into the internet and realized that there was this opportunity that presented itself to uh, simply have no clear point of of residence as a consciousness, to be uh, a diffuse being uh, without necessary jurisdictional boundaries to be placed on oneself, uh, where, where boundaries of any sort were going to be very difficult to enforce, uh, I was delighted. Now many uh, who came into that realization much later in the game were anything but delighted. And the fellow who wrote the long piece in the Washington Post basically slagging me for having created a utopian vision of the internet and then turned it into a, a, a as far as I can tell, a, a nasty sort of big brother state where it, Google is big brother and, and um, Facebook, and this is all somehow my doing. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the headline was uh, one of the most awkward things I ever read. Uh, Here is the man who first uh, idealized the internet into a utopia and, and then warped it or something. What, what was it? It was something like that. <laughs> and so I, had, I was given a huge amount of authority there that I hadn't known I had at the time. But I did feel like I had some because um, as my friend Alan Kay says, uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I knew instinctively that it was also true that a good way to invent the future was to predict it. Uh, especially if you predicted it with enough rhetorical flash uh, that you intentionally appealed to the American instinct to see it as either or and could portray what you knew was the greatest surveillance tool ever devised as a, a liberty uh, granting utopia. And, and people bought that for quite a long time, I'm pleased to say. I, and I intentionally hoodwinked them. I mean, the guy who wrote the piece in the Washington Post is correct about that. I knew better but I thought that it would be a good idea to get everybody to think that at least at one level, the internet was always going to be about freedom from authority. 
And I think that is still largely true. In, in 1996, I wrote something, this is what was getting most of the blame, uh, called the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. I was, I was at the World Economic Forum. Uh, it was closing night and all the, the sort of, uh, <laughs> there's a kind of geisha doctoral student at the University of Geneva uh, that, that runs the World Economic Forum and they were having a dance. And, uh, and on that day, the President of the United States had signed into law uh, the Communications Decency Act, which, which claimed to have the ability to tell everybody online that uh, they could not use certain words that I'd heard used many times in the Senate dining room uh, without going to jail and having a, a severe criminal penalty applied to them. By what jurisdiction, authority, or, or enforcement power Neither he nor I knew, uh, but it was a popular thing to do, and so he was signing this anyway. And, and I, I got into one of those sort of slightly drunken and philosophical moods where, where I thought that it would be a good idea to imitate, unfortunately I decided to imitate the style of a former slaveholder, Thomas Jefferson, uh, and imitate the style of Thomas Jefferson and declare not that we were setting ourselves free, but that cyberspace actually was free and always would be in some essential sense in the same way, and I didn't make a fine enough point of this, in the same way that the mind is not the body. Now, it may be extremely dependent on the body. Uh, I don't deny that but it is relatively easy to capture the body and do all manner of things to it, to constrain it. It is a little more difficult to capture the mind as somebody like Mandela shows us, you know, the ability of that man to sit there for, what was it, 40 years, breaking up little rocks and still be who he was. It tells you about the, the ability of the mind to be separate from the body. Uh, and, I, and I felt in the same way that the mind of humanity, the collective mind, was about to supersede uh, all of the sovereignties that had previously been laid against it and that there would be roughly what there is, which is to say a social space that was not particularly... Um, congenial to having governance imposed on it. Now, part of the problem with that is that I'm a great believer in rights. I love rights. Uh, but I also know that rights depend entirely on the ability of a government credible enough to deny you those rights. And if you don't have a government that can do that, then you don't have a government that can convey them. So you have to come up with other ways of governance, and I could see, and I think we can still see here, that those other ways of governance urgently need to be found because it is going to go on being very difficult to govern cyberspace, or whatever they call it. I, I think only, only the Army calls it cyberspace now. It's about the me and the Army. Uh, but the, they will never get sovereignty over it. I mean, it, it, many people say, well, what about China? Well, what about China? The last time I was in China, if you had tails, uh, which is a, a joint product of the uh, Tour Foundation, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, the State Department, and the U.S. Navy, uh, if you have tails and a, and a good blank machine, you can go anywhere on the internet you want. No problemo. And nobody can see where you are. I mean, it's not, it's not particularly difficult to do. Uh, and this is gonna be the case for a long time. Now, in my, in my earlier enthusiasm for hastening the demise of the nation state, 
which I felt motivated to do by virtue of the fact that one of the remaining things that nation states did was declare a nuclear war on one another. And I'd spent 40 years of my life thinking that human race was going to blow itself to bits over some principle uh, be just because they had nuclear weapons and, uh, and they disagreed. Uh, and that was a sort of a clearly odd nation state thing to do that the human beings would never do. And so I felt like we were gonna have to come up with something that fundamentally limited the nation state and gave humans much greater authority in their own affairs. Now I am coming from Wyoming where the code of the West works because there are 2.3 people per square mile. <laughs> you know, it's not like other places uh, where law actually is a great help. Uh, in Wyoming, law is mostly in the way, or as, as the Brazilians say of it, law is for your enemies. Uh, but I thought that one of the best things you could do to, to limit the authority of the nation state would be to take away its money supply. So as soon as I realized, I was introduced to this idea by David Chaum, uh, probably personally known to many of you, uh, back in about 1989 or 1990, that it would be possible to have digital currencies that were self-authenticating. Now, there was gonna be a bit of a trick turning them into real money. I mean, the, the portal between the, between the world banking system and, and DigiCash or any of the other schemes that I became associated with while I was trying to come up with ways of, of making money that was invisible to the, to the federal government, um, all had that problem of, of the government seeing this sort of thing coming and getting to the banks and saying, no, 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 you're not going to take that stuff. And then PayPal came along and it was a pretty good shot at it, though they, they really, you know, at the, at the last critical moment they did decide that it, that it was better, whatever their philosophical beliefs, it was better to have an incredibly successful company and become ridiculously rich than fight over the principle, which had been the, the downfall of, of many people like, like David Chaum up to that point. And so they backed off. Well then this, I think, completely fictitious Japanese character, <laughs> comes up with something that is, it's a really kind of elegant hack, though it's, it has this peculiar brittleness to it, which is that it has an, an, a built-in upper limit on how many of these things that you can have, these Bitcoins. And, and moreover, the, the higher you get in the number of Bitcoins, the more of the entire electrical system of your country has to be devoted to making the next one. <laughs> so that's a funny detail. But, um, <laughs> and there's also the fact that, that because of blockchain, you know, there has never been a better way to keep track of what somebody is doing with money. And it is, it is precisely those kinds of paradoxes that I think you're gonna find entertaining over the next few days because uh, the only way you can get through this discussion is to be thinking both and, both and, both and all the time. Because one of the things that you're going to be about here, I hope, is trying to come up with a way uh, or, or to further the various methods that are now evolving of giving you a way to have both absolutely reliable identity and at the same time absolutely reliable ability to act anonymously in a financial transaction where you can separate your identity, the physical self, from the transacting entity, the where your credit card becomes your avatar and it's no longer a credit card, it's a, it's a Bitcoin wallet and, or something 
presumably more advanced than that. And, um, and that can either be or not be you. Uh, and you can make that determination very quickly and fluidly. And that's one of the things that I think you need to be thinking about. I, I, I just finally saw uh, Mr. Clippinger's uh, mustard seed you know, which I, I don't know who else to give credit to for that, uh, but I think it's, it's really quite wonderful because uh, it does the thing that I've been wanting to get done for a long time. It takes all of those things that the body itself is, uh, is continuously manifesting, and it also takes all those relationships, and it puts a web, it puts a node in that web that is a self, that can be defined at various levels of selfness. And that's kind of what I've been wanting all along. Uh, obviously, the government didn't want that very much. Uh, but I felt like it was absolutely critical because there are, you know, personally, I don't care about privacy. Uh, I was raised in this place that I tell you about uh, where nobody had any anyway. Uh, Sublette County, Wyoming is the, only, is the only county in the United States where the county seat doesn't have a stoplight. It's about the size of Connecticut and has 4,000 people living in it. And we all know each other extremely well. I mean, you could go to the Wrangler Cafe in Pinedale, Wyoming today, and even though I haven't been around much lately, you could still find out stuff about me that I don't know. <laughs> and it would be true. Uh, so, I didn't have much privacy, and, and moreover, I knew at an early age that I was, uh, I was unemployable having been raised by alcoholic cowboys and farm animals. I was, I was never going to be a good interchangeable machine part in a large corporate organism. I would just, nobody was going to be the boss of me. And they haven't been pretty much. Uh, which gives me this great advantage, uh, which is that since I could speak, I could say whether, whatever I goddamn well pleased, as long as, it was, as long as I was somewhat polite and somewhat tactful. And as I get older, I find that, that I, 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 I don't try to spare people's feelings exactly, but I just try to find better ways to lubricate the things that I want to say that are absolutely true that other people don't say, because I think that's an important job. And I have it because I don't want to work for a company or anybody else. Many of you are perforce in a situation, whether in academia or some other place, where you, you have to pretend that you're not yourself, which is a pity, because I actually find that you can be yourself and do better. I mean, I, I've been consulting uh, intimately to the same intelligence agencies that I am, you know, suing and, and protecting Edward Snowden from and various different things. They all know that. I mean, I'm completely open double agent. <laughs> they wanted to give me a security clearance to begin with. I said, no, I can't give me a security clearance. I still take acid. And they said, well, you could lie. <laughs> I said, I'm trying to get you guys over lying. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, the truth will set you free. <laughs> uh, this has been a hard sell in a place where, you know, stopping information from moving meant that you had bigger cojones than the other guy. <laughs> it's really stupid. <laughs> Since, you know, the... <laughs> The way I see it, the more information you can move around uh, and distribute, the more, the more minds, the better off you are. But never mind that. I, I uh, have found that there is a great sort of schizoid feeling within the governments of the world about, about the secrecy that they have been trying to maintain uh, with increasing avidity ever since it became difficult for the, for the individual to maintain any privacy. Now, I'd realized 
in about 1987 that everybody was going to be just as visible as I was. Every individual in the world was likely to be as easy to see as I was in Pinedale, Wyoming, unless things were done, generally using cryptography and a few other things, that gave them the ability to hide. And I, I felt like it was important, even though I decided to lead my own life as a test bed for complete revelation, uh, I thought it was important that there were some people that I knew could not, could not be honest as I was uh, without losing their job at minimum and, and in many cases having their head cut off. So I've spent an awful lot of time with EFF and other organizations trying to figure out ways to assure that anonymity is something that is almost never used. I mean, I feel like, I feel the same way about anonymity that I feel about guns. I think they may be useful to have in the closet in case the government gets really out of control. Though we have a lot of guns in the, in the closet and the government's out of control and it doesn't seem to matter. Um, but that, that, that anonymity should never be used if at all possible because it, it causes a breakdown in civility and responsibility. And you know, just look at the difference between the quality of discourse on <laughs> Facebook, God save us, uh, and YouTube, where you can't, you can't go more than four comments deep on YouTube without, without things turning into a, you know, the, the, the id howling <laughs> to no particular purpose anonymously. Uh, whereas on Facebook, I often find really exquisite and beautiful things said by people I don't know. And um, because they are people who somebody knows. Uh, but I, I, I think that we are all headed towards a condition of, of visibility, and I don't think there's any way around that. Uh, what EFF and other organizations like it have been trying to do is to, is to make it possible to cloak oneself at least until we could figure out ways to make sure that the institutions that were getting better and better and better at looking at every detail of us were equally transparent. Because it's this asymmetry that I think is the issue. This is why, this is why everybody should, should be a, a fan of Ed Snowden because what he was trying to do and, and what a great many other people inside the NSA were trying to do with him since there's no way in hell that he got all that information by himself, is to turn the organization into something that people can see so that they will quit being afraid of it. Because it doesn't do any good for people to fear their own government, nor does it do good for people to be completely vulnerable uh, in their privacy to large institutions who may form opinions about their behavior that are not visible to them. What you want is institutions where if opinions are to be formed, you have the, at least the ability to see that they have been, and you don't find yourself in that. How many people saw Brazil, the movie? It's my favorite movie. You don't, you don't find yourself being Buttle instead of Tuttle, uh, you know. Uh, and many, many things like that are already happening and, and the government is getting more opaque with every day. And I, and I think that this will reach a breaking point relatively soon and everybody will realize that it's just simply impractical and besides, we don't even know who the enemy is. We know there are bad guys. Yemen just got taken over by them. And we know that you know, there are bad guys uh, along a, a number of major highways in Iraq at the moment, much, much the creation of the United States, I'd have to say. Uh, but we don't, know, we don't know what a nation state is for any intents and purposes. Uh, as the, when he, he was still um, 
chief of naval operations, uh, a lovely man who then became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, helped me out here. He was, the, he was from the Navy, uh, most, recent, most recent Joint Chiefs of Staff chair before the present one. Um, it'll come to me. I'm an old man. The drugs actually did do some damage. Um, in any case, he said to me one night, I was doing some consulting for the Navy, and, and he said, you know, what this looks like to me is the Crips versus the Bloods, and what have I got? An aircraft carrier, which, <laughs> put it in a nutshell, that's the problem. Uh, we, don't, we don't have an understanding of the bad guy and we also don't understand the bad guy inside ourselves. And, and one of the things that I think that this conference needs to take up also in its dealing with identity and anonymity and, and trust is, you know, how do we deal with those elements of our own personality that need to be visible to us? Because that's generally where the evil lies. It's, it's not in the other fella, it's in you first and foremost. And, and that, that is true whether we're talking about a, a single individual or whether we're talking about a nation state. Now I, I'm very, very keen on you folks here developing uh, the blockchain into something that is uh, much more adaptable, less easily manipulated, uh, much more fungible. I mean, if I had more time, I would, I would run down a whole theory I have about how I think it would be a swell idea if you could actually make an economy that was based on carbon, where gold used to be, and just assign carbon a value that was the basis for your currency so that people would have a really strong reason to go out and mine carbon instead of extremely long numbers and mine it out of the atmosphere, which is what my current enterprise is doing. I'd, I'd like to see a lot more people doing that. I, have, I do have a, an ulterior motive, but my ulterior motive includes the idea that I will be a good ancestor. And I think that to close, the real responsibility everybody has here is to be a good ancestor. You are designing the architecture of liberty and enslavement, both, in these tools that are being derived around the blockchain and other things like it. And what you do and the, and, and the way in which you do it will have long-lasting effects. I have a very warm relationship with Vint Cerf. Uh, and I, I think often about that moment in Vint's life when Vint decided that he was gonna take the TCPIP protocol, which he had been paid quite a bit of money to produce and which his department had been paid quite a bit of money to produce and was supposed to be something that was a, uh, a military product of the United States government for command and control of nuclear weapons, possibly, maybe not. I once asked Paul Barron whether that was what it was for, packet switching. I said, did you just really want a, a, something that couldn't be decapitated by a nuclear attack? And he said, no, I wanted something that didn't have a head. <laughs> so, you know, Paul Barron didn't look like a uh, you know, bomb-wielding anarchist, but um, he was. And, and, <laughs> and so in a, in a very, very recondite, dapper, and genteel, gentlemanly way is Vint Cerf because he decided to take it upon himself to release the TCPIP protocol knowing that it would spread like crazy and that it would make it very, very difficult except for the problem that we have with DNS, and surely we can solve that. I think that somewhere in the, actually somewhere in, in the mathematics around the blockchain is a way to deal with the DNS problem too. And I hope you'll, you'll be thinking about that. Anyway, 
I, this is a ramble, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't know I was gonna do this two days ago. Uh, I thought I was going to have a chance to study more before I took this exam. Uh, or I'd get more technical on your ass. But uh, the main thing I wanna tell you is that this is very important. What you're doing here is important. And it's important that you make it fluid and that you make it adaptable and interoperable and that you give the powers that have been a relatively graceful way of scaling themselves down before you just simply make all of their money invisible and make it very difficult to ever tax anybody ever again. Thank you.